Hi, I'm Yulia, and at this point, I know you're excited to see me again. This is the News Brief, and here we catch up with four to six news stories every other day that I expertly tailor because, in my humble opinion, they're the most relevant to today. Then we discuss them in the comments so you don't have to suffer alone and I don't have to suffer alone. And of course, I ask you to leave your feedback and constructive criticism so I can continue tailoring this segment to your needs and curiosities. I see all of them and I read all of them. Another day and another horror of living next to Russia. We've had rolling blackouts since August 26th when Russia so generously rained missiles on all Ukrainian cities. I now plan my days two to three business days in advance, depending on what the schedule of electricity cutoffs is like. And I will tell you, it doesn't always match reality. And it's really fun to not have your washing machine working and all of your other appliances when you're raising a four months old puppy. Yeah, accidents everywhere. My um, apartment at this point smells like a stable, but you know what? I'm alive and that is the most important thing here. Meanwhile, of course, Russia does not stop terrorizing our country further. And what's happening to me and to most people in Kyiv is not even a fraction of the horrors that people closer to the front line experience. Russia launched a nighttime attack on Ukraine with the following known details. Zaporizhia. Russian drones bombarded the city and surrounding districts. A man was killed and a man and a woman were injured. Private homes were damaged and dry grass caught fire. Emergency services responded to this situation and you can see it on the video. In this footage, you were also able to see civilians being pulled from under the rubble, and as of right now, we do not know what numbers of fatalities they experienced. In Kravirih, initial reports indicate that one person was killed and four were injured. A civilian object was damaged, and there may still be people trapped under the rubble. In a rocket attack on a hotel in Kravirih, two people, a man and a woman, were killed. According to Lysak, the head of the regional military administration, five others were injured. A 43-year-old woman is in a serious condition in the hospital, and a 37-year-old man is also hospitalized, but in a moderate condition. Three others Others are recovering at home. Rescue teams are still searching for two more people who may be trapped under the rubble. The attack also caused damage to six shops, four high-rise buildings, and eight cars. Emergency services remain on site, continuing their efforts. And here is a video that you can see from Suspilna. I absolutely hate watching this footage and, you know, I hate that I have to do it every day and I do it willingly because I want to stay informed, but it's just so devastating. In Kherson, the enemy fired at an ambulance brigade rushing to help the wounded. Injuring three medical workers, reported Roman Mrochko, head of the city's military administration. In the Dnipro district of Kherson, a 63-year-old man sustained a mine explosive injury and shrapnel wounds due to an enemy drone attack. The ambulance brigade that hurried to assist him also came under enemy fire, because of course we are dealing with Russia and they are not humane. The victim suffered explosive injuries and concussions, and the ambulance was damaged. They also experienced TBIs. I will also say something because I feel like it's important to give this feedback, but a lot of Ukrainian news outlets and a lot of um, 
Ukrainian information sources like to use words like contusions, because in Ukrainian, a TBI, a.k.a. a traumatic brain injury, is a contusia. So when you see the word contusion, know that it refers to TBIs. And once you look at that, following all of these attacks, especially the one on the 26th that damaged a hydroelectric power plant, and following Joseph Borrell's continuous pleas to let Ukraine use Western weapons in Russia, we finally see some movement to that end. It seems that even John Kirby and, I hope, Mr. Sullivan, I mean, if you're watching it, I truly hope that you're going to get this realization very soon, you know two and a half years into the war, almost three soon, but better late than never. Anyways, have finally realized that Putin's escalation is just a word and a fear that exists inside their own minds and not a real threat. John Kirby, the coordinator of strategic communications at the White House National Security Council, acknowledged that negotiations with Ukraine regarding the possibility of extending the range of American weapons strikes into Russian territory are ongoing but remain confidential. I mean, that's already better than, you know, John Kirby and Jake Sullivan. Sorry, I'm going to have to mention him a lot here because I think he carries quite a bit of personal responsibility. And to those people in the comments who are going to say it's not him, it's the president or it's not him, it's the cabinet. He has been the national security advisor since Obama's times, and he is responsible for advising presidents on what to do. Basically, it's much better than them flat out saying no. So it is progress, and I hope that this progress continues growing. He emphasized that while President Zelensky's concerns are understandable given Ukraine's current situation, discussions on this sensitive matter will continue to be held privately. Kirby also noted that there are no updates or policy changes on the use of American weapons that can be publicly disclosed at this time. It's interesting because every single time a decision is about to be made, um, Western authorities say that they want to keep it private because normally when there is no decision about to be made, they just say no. So that's exciting. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg will convene a meeting of the Ukraine NATO Council on Wednesday at Kyiv's request. Alliance spokeswoman Oana Lungescu emphasized that the meeting follows the wave of recent Russian attacks on Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. NATO members have provided substantial support to Ukraine's air defense and are committed to further strengthening Ukraine's defenses, the representative of the Secretary General assured. I am going to not assure you, but suggest and I guess derive from this, that this uh, summit or this meeting is going to be specifically about letting Ukraine strike into Russia, because at this point, I think most of the world has realized that it's defense, not offense. And that, again, Putin's red lines only exist in mostly Jake Sullivan's head. Because he's the creator of the escalation line that seems to be a response to everything Ukraine requests. But anyways, can you tell I'm a little mad at Jake Sullivan? Yeah, I think it reads. President Zelensky gave an incredibly information packed and information heavy, but also such an important press conference today. And there is a lot to unpack here. So we're going to do just that for the first time since the beginning of the full scale invasion. And I guess the invasion of Ukraine by Russia in general, our government let everyone know that they're not going to present a peace plan but a victory plan. And that's a huge change of rhetoric. I know, what a wording. It's exciting, at least because usually when a victory plan or something along those lines is presented as wording, that means that our authorities might have some aces of spades in their back pockets. And I, for one, am very curious. Ukrainian officials are preparing to present a detailed list of potential military targets in Russia to U.S. national security officials in an effort to convince Washington to lift its restrictions on the use of U.S. weapons for strikes inside Russian territory. According to Politico, Ukrainian Defense Minister Rustam Umerov and senior advisor Andriy Yermak will personally deliver this list during high-level talks in Washington this week. I love this because what's basically happening is Ukraine is like, hey, the U.S., you know that we have been using all of the weapons responsibly. We do not strike Russian civilians. We do not misuse the weapons. We always follow rules and guidelines of war. And escalation is a myth. Please let us strike inside Russia's territory so we can take out their military airfields and bases that continuously keep killing our people under airstrikes every day. And the U.S. is like, 
We don't know. I mean, we can't trust you because it's not like you've shown a perfect track record. And also, escalation. So Ukraine is like, all right, well, you can't trust us to make our own decisions on what to strike. Here is a list of facilities we would like um, to be not utilizable anymore. Brilliant. Ukraine's argument centers in the belief that these far-reaching strikes would bolster its military efforts by hitting key Russian targets, some of which Kyiv insists remain vulnerable despite Russia moving its assets further from the border. However, the U.S. has expressed concerns that such actions could escalate the conflict, with Russia potentially responding with even more aggressive attacks on Ukraine. Aw, really? Um, you mean like the 120 something missiles the other day and 100 something drones also the other day? So 200 aerial objects that were all here to kill us the other day? Those types of attacks? Russia cannot escalate any further than just continuously send all the missiles they have onto us. And you know what? We don't love it, but we're used to it. That is not an escalation that is just living next to Russia. Russia doesn't respond to things like Kursk because then what was, you know, January 2nd? What were all of these other attacks? A, res a response to what? Russia just does it because they can. And from what we're seeing, they're losing the ability to do it to begin with because, yes, sure, that was the most massive missile and UAV strike that Ukraine has seen since the beginning of the full scale invasion. But also, we've noticed that Russia was using a lot of really cheap missiles that came from North Korea, like Ken like KN-23, I believe they're called, and a lot of them landed in water. So yeah, they were a bit lost. There is speculation that the Biden administration may be reconsidering its stance on the restrictions, as some Ukrainian officials and lawmakers have observed signs of a possible shift in U.S. policy. I can't imagine why that would be. Is that because everyone is finally actually waking up to the reality that Putin, what can Putin do to escalate? Send more missiles? Oh, no, it's not like we get missiles rained on us every day. And also, again, those strikes could prevent Russia being able to use those missiles. So kind of like, you know, the math isn't mathing here. Anyways, the decision could significantly impact Ukraine's ability to conduct offensive operations beyond its borders, a move that Kyiv sees as critical for countering Russian advances. And here we're getting to a very, very interesting part that I, for one, am very curious and very excited about, because as I mentioned prior, the change in wording is crucial. In September, I will present a victory plan to the U.S. president and share it with Harris and Trump, said Zelensky. One part of the plan, which is already underway, focuses on the Kursk region. The second part outlines Ukraine's strategic role in global security. The third involves a strong diplomatic push to force Russia to end the war. The fourth part is economic. I won't go into details now, but the plan is ready, Zelensky said. He added that he will first present the plan to President Biden during their September meeting and then share it with presidential candidates Kamala Harris and Donald Trump. Woo, can't wait. And before we get to some technical statements, because again, this was a very info heavy press conference and all of this info is so interesting and so impactful. I do want to say that, you know, all of these countries that push Ukraine to basically capitulate under the guise of um, let's just talk peace with Russia and give them what they want. Um, they all say, well, you can't really negotiate what you want and the return of your territories unless you have something to hold over them. And Ukraine would never be able to have something like that. Well, meet Kursk. That's something to hold over Russia, isn't it? Ukraine used F-16 fighter jets to repel a massive air attack on August 26, Zelensky announced during a press conference. He noted that the fighters performed very well, helping to shoot down several missiles. The war will inevitably end in dialogue, but we need to enter that dialogue from a position of strength, he also stated, which reiterates my statement that we do have a position of strength right now, and arguably we have had it for a while. It's just the West, for some reason, continues to see Russia as the empire it's not anymore and won't be. No one will sign a contract with the Russian Federation to continue the transit of Russian gas through Ukraine. This is non-negotiable. 
The Kursk operation had and still has entirely different objectives than the negotiations between Ukraine and the Russian Federation regarding the cessation of strikes on energy facilities, President Zelensky said. And I will probably add that, yeah, it has nothing to do with... Um, you know, exchanging course for the cessation of hostilities on energy facilities, I think it has a lot to do with the territorial exchange and with having an ace of spades to negotiate with. The Russian Federation should not know the condition of our energy facilities, which they attacked. Let that remain undisclosed. Yeah, I think it's a very important bit where, you know, um, we live in the era of the digital age and everything goes on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook or whatever it might be before it ever gets confirmed by official sources. Please stop spreading information about what damage Russia caused and to which specific facilities. We purposely do not say that on air because it is operational security and it's very important. I mean, they already have enough information to know what they hit and where. Why are we helping them further? The Donetsk region is a strategic objective for the Russian Federation. Russia is not withdrawing its troops from there to the Kursk region. Of course, they weren't going to. We are not prepared to exchange any of our territories as part of any negotiations. And I know you've heard that statement so many times, but it is so important to keep reiterating because we've given our blood, sweat and tears for those territories. And those territories, I will repeat again, are people. There are difficulties with the return of the Azov fighters. A new format for coordinating the lists has been adopted. Now, not only the main directorate of intelligence, but also the state security service, the SBU and the ombudsman and foreign intelligence are involved in agreeing on these lists, Zelensky added, because there have been so many questions as to why in a year worth of recent exchanges, there has not been a single Azov fighter exchanged from Russia. And of course, you know, the broader public is starting to blame the government, our own government. And, you know, the families understandably are devastated. So there is a lot of discourse in society about that. But the reality is that Russia does not want to exchange them. And they're very, very difficult to exchange. And if you want to watch the full conference, Zelensky goes into further details as to why that happens. But he did assure us that with this new format on negotiation of POWs, it's hopefully going to change very soon. And we're going to see some of our Azov boys come home. During the conference, Zelensky also said these statements. Poland's focus on Ukraine's defense capabilities has diminished. Ukraine needs Polish MiGs. Zelensky believes the U.S. should support Poland in its efforts to intercept Russian missiles. Yeah, it's fully reasonable to take them down on approach whether they're going to enter the country or not. There were also a lot of concerns that the EU and NATO chiefs were expressing over all the Russian missile debris that keeps landing in NATO territory. Yeah, let Poland take it down before it ever gets there. That's the solution and it's reasonable. It's not an escalation. It's a prevention tactic. The operation in the Kursk region is defensive. Kyiv does not seek foreign lands or citizens. Ukraine does not oppose Russia's participation in the Second Peace Summit, as many other countries support it. And because now they'll have to talk to us because, you know, Kursk. I mean, by that I mean actually talk to us, not just dictate their own conditions, blackmail us and give us ultimatums. Ah, oh, what a great position to be in. Ukrainian manufacturers can produce 1.5 to 2 million drones per year, but there is a shortage of funding for this. And that brings me to my next point, which, well, first of all, hopefully we can get that funding from foreign defense companies and, and we can also sell those drones to many other states because I don't know if you've realized this, but China and Iran are the largest drone manufacturers right now. It's not the US, it's not Germany, it's not France. Um, but Ukraine now has the capacity to produce a lot of drones and we also have a capacity to sell them to these countries that are lacking the production of it. But anyways, I digressed quite a bit. Zelensky was not the only person with really good news today. So was Sirsky. Commander-in-Chief Sirsky revealed for the first time that 594 Russian servicemen have been taken prisoner in the Kursk direction. He also stated that the defense forces currently control 1,295 square kilometers of Russian territory and about 100 settlements. He made these remarks at the Ukraine 2024 forum. 
We took more territory of Russia in about less than a month than Russia has been able to invade or keep since the beginning of its full-scale invasion and its invasion in general um, years ago. Oops. Additionally, he mentioned that Russia is not withdrawing troops from Ukrainian Pokrovsk due to the Kursk operation, but is instead focusing its efforts there. Russia has transferred around 30,000 troops from reserves and other areas to reinforce the Kursk direction. So the idea that Kursk was a distraction from Donetsk was um, faulty from the very beginning. Russia was never going to give up Donetsk. They were going to just, you know... Um, scramble for other fighters to send to Kursk. But it's really difficult to take land back. It's much easier to take the land. Though that does break the myth of Putin saying that, you know, his biggest strength is that he keeps Russia safe and that Russia is this unpenetrable fortress. Well, I mean, we were able to penetrate it pretty easily. And I don't want to make a very immature, that's what she said, joke, but... And I know that we have had a string of very good news in the past 10 minutes of this episode. But of course, everything can't always be rainbows and butterflies when your neighbor is an egomaniacal former empire with a Napoleon complex. If you don't know what a Napoleon complex is, I implore you to look it up. Or you know what? I'm just going to put it on the screen right here. So here's this. North Korea has sent over 13,000 containers of weapons to Russia since mid-2022, according to a South Korean military intelligence report cited by Yonhap. I might have mispronounced that, but Yonhap? Yonhap? Intelligence estimates suggest around 6,152mm artillery shells were shipped from the North Korean port of Najin during this period. North Korea may have also provided Russia with 122mm artillery shells, as well as mobile anti-aircraft and anti-tank missiles. The report states, To prepare for a protracted war in Ukraine, Russia has officially registered North Korea as a base for weapons and ammunition supplies, which explains the KN-23 missiles that don't hit their targets, which is the one good part of this. If you didn't know, North Korea is a dictatorship and dictatorships usually um, do not produce things very well because um, people don't like to report mistakes and shortages because they're all yes men scared of prosecution. And, you know, speaking of North Korea being a dictatorship, now they're best friends with Russia. They've opened all of this international trade with Russia. They're becoming an up and coming country again. It's a joke. But you know what? North Korea is also opening soon. Um, tourism. North Korea is going to allow tourists. I... What kind of world do we live in? And also, like, I understand people who are going to want to go there because they want to see what North Korea is like because it's highly communist and a dictatorship and looks like it's um, 55 to 85 years backwards. But what on actual earth? How is this? Do we live in a simulation? Can someone please pinch me? Because I feel like we live in a simulation. According to Defense Express, the Shahed-136 drone, produced by Russia's best friend Iran, another lovely country, uh, can stay in the air over Ukraine for six and a half to twelve and a half hours, depending on the launch site and actual flight range. And um, I can confirm from my own experience, the air raid in Kyiv lasted for 13 hours on uh, the 26th, which I believe was a Monday. And one of the reasons why this air raid lasted so long before and after the missile had already landed or have been taken down is because Shahed drones were literally having a roller coaster ride in our air for hours at a time. And it was strange because that has never happened before. They were just changing directions, flying back and forth and just not going down, not striking anything. They weren't being intercepted. It was chaos. But yeah, they can stay in our airspace for 12 hours hours. That's a very, very long flight range. The drone has a cruising speed of 180 kilometers an hour and an estimated flight range of 1,500 kilometers, giving it an average flight time of about eight and a half hours. However, Western sources suggest a longer flight range of up to 2,500 kilometers, which could allow it to stay in the air for up to 14 hours. <laughs> Yay. 
Taking into account the time needed for the drone to reach Ukrainian airspace, its potential time circling over Ukraine ranges from six and a half to twelve and a half hours. That's longer than I sleep on most days. <laughs> it's it's crazy. But Ukraine isn't just watching this in horror, though. We are adapting and we take this opportunity to advance, evolve and be better, especially in the military sector. Since the start of Russia's full-scale invasion, Ukraine has significantly ramped up its military production, investing $7 billion in its domestic defense industry this year alone, stated Ukrainian Defense Minister Rustem Umerov at the Ukraine 2024 Independence Forum. We are boosting the nation's strength through the acquisition of drones, robotic systems and electronic warfare technology, which is already delivering tangible results on the battlefield, as our defenders can attest. One of our key priorities is long term planning. We are building a defense forces model aligned with NATO standards, implementing digital solutions and modernizing the army, Umerov said. And um, Ukraine has tested its first ballistic missile the other day. Mm hmm. Ballistic missile. Give us enough time and invest enough funds into us. And I can assure you we're going to have the best drones and ballistic missiles that the world has yet to see, because boy, are we determined. The Ukrainian long-range missile Palanitsa costs around $1 million, Minister of Digital Transformation Mikhailo Fedorov told the Associated Press. However, Ukraine is working to reduce this cost by involving the private sector. For comparison, most Russian missiles cost around 6 to $7 million to produce, and that's on the lower end. Fedorov noted that Palanitsa will enable Ukraine to strike deep into Russian rare positions without needing permission from Western allies. The drone has a range of up to 700 kilometers, comparable to the American Atakams missiles. Also, Palanitsa is a word that Ukrainians were using in the beginning of the full-scale invasion to identify whether the soldiers they encounter are Ukrainian or Russians pretending to be Ukrainian, because Russians cannot for the life of them say Palanitsa, which literally means a piece of bread. So, so, you know, when that hits them, they won't even be able to pronounce what hit them. <laughs> and I think that is a great joke to wrap up today's episode on. And as always, I will see you next time, which in this case is going to be on Tuesday. In the meanwhile, please don't forget to turn on all of your notifications and of course, subscribe to The Gaze. G-A-Z-E. -E. But hey, you can also subscribe to The Gaze. Don't forget to leave your comments, questions and suggestions. I read them all. And please, please, please like this video so it has an easier time breaking through the world wide web and reaching its correct audience. See you next time.